Do you know what the possible values are for the spin? Um, positive half or negative. Right. This is the simplest of them all, because it doesn't matter what your n is or what your l is or what your m sub l is, there's two possible spins, negative one half and positive one half. This is for electrons, by the way. All the stuff that we've been doing here is electrons. Um, other particles could have different types of spins. Other particles could have integer spins, say. But an electron has to have a negative one half or a positive one half uh, spin over here. All right, and that is the end of the Pauli exclusion principle. So the Pauli exclusion principle says, clearly these two electrons are in the same n and the same l and the same m sub l. So there has to be some difference between them. And the difference is different m sub s's. The Pauli exclusion principle says, any two electrons are excluded from having all four numbers the same. You're excluded from having all four numbers the same. So if you're in the same shell and the same subshell and the same orbital, you must have different spins. That's why you should never draw this, because this would violate the Pauli exclusion principle. This would be two electrons in the same shell, subshell, and orbital, and with the same spin. So that violates the Pauli exclusion principle. Uh, but this is in accord with it because these do not have all four numbers the same. They have three numbers the same, but their spin numbers are different. We might say this is positive one half and this is negative one half. Notice that these are the only numbers that can be fractions. If you see any other numbers that are fractions, it must be wrong. The other numbers have to be integers. The ends have to be positive integers. The L's have to be non-negative integers. That includes zero. And the M sub L's could be negative zero or positive integers in, in the right range. But these are the two fractions, negative one half and positive one half. OK. Um, now, there's a couple of questions in your homework I don't want to get into too much, because I don't think that it'll be on the exams. But let me just point out how you can kind of come to grips with this in the homework. Um, one of the purposes of L here is that L tells you your angular momentum. So remember how um, in classical physics, things are, tend to be continuous. You can take on any value in a continuum. But in modern physics, many things are quantized. Only certain values are possible. One of the things that's quantized in the atom is angular momentum. Only certain angular momentums are possible. Only certain angular momentums are possible. And it turns out that these numbers quantize the angular momentums. L equals 0, 1, 2, and 3. Why don't you take out your textbook and turn to page 650? Here's the equation I'm looking at. All right, and this tells you what your angular momentum is. Capital L stands for angular momentum. Capital L stands for angular momentum. So for example, if you were in the S block, your L would be 0. And then if you plug in L equals 0, you would figure out what your angular momentum is. I guess you would get 0 angular momentum. And if you were in the P block, your L, lowercase L would be 1. And then your capital L would be the square root of 1 times 2 times h bar. All right, so there's a couple homework problems where we have to plug into this formula. Remember, capital L stands for angular momentum. And then the h bar is h over 2 pi. That's right. That's good that you know that. H bar is Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. That's good. OK. Uh, and again, this is showing us that angular momentum is quantized. That is, it can only take on certain values. It can only take on um, 0 times 1 times h bar root, or root 1 times 2 times h bar, or root 2 times 3 times h bar, or root 3 times 4 times h bar. This should strike you as kind of weird, because in real life, say, a, um, a, uh, a, um, an ice skater can have any angular momentum they want. Right? They can, go, they can spin as fast or slow as they want. 
They can spin really fast and have a hot, fast angular momentum or spin very slow and have a low angular momentum. You know that they can control how fast they're spinning by how close they bring their arms to themselves. Um, but it turns out that in the atom, you can't have continuous angular momentums. Only certain, certain angular momentums are possible. The angular momenta are quantized. And this is the formula that gives you what your angular momentum is. So the point is, since L is quantized, since lowercase L is quantized, this formula tells us that capital L is quantized. This is for electrons that are stuck in an atom. This gives you the total angular momentum. But you know that the angular momentum could be broken into components, right? It could be broken into x, y, and z components. Well, the angular momentum along the z-axis, say, is also quantized. And this is the formula 3610 on page 651. m sub l times h bar. So for example, if you knew that m sub l was 2, you could figure out that the angular momentum on the z-axis is 2 times h bar. Or if you knew that m sub l was negative 1, you would know that the angular momentum along the z-axis was negative 1 times h bar. It only gives you one of the components. It just gives you one component. That's right. Uh, so capital L here gives you the total angular momentum. And it turns out that the angular momentum along a particular axis is also quantized. And this gives us the possible angular momentum along that axis as well. So actually, I don't think they wrote that too well in the book, because in the book, they just said L. But what they really meant was LZ. Otherwise, this would be the same as this formula over here. So you might want to fix this and say this should really be LZ. This is the angular momentum along a particular axis. All right, we can talk for a long time about exactly what the heck that means, but I don't think it's a bit, that would be the best use of our time. I don't think this is going to be a big issue on the test. I just wanted to point this out briefly, because you'll need this to do the homework. You'll need to plug in this of these formulas in the homework. Okay, but I don't think these are going to come up on the test. All right. Um, there's a couple other formulas you might have to plug into. For example, spin is quantized. This, uh, the component of spin along an axis, you could use this equation. And there's also this equation that might come up. So this is a page you might need to refer to for the homework uh, to plug in some numbers here. We didn't really talk about what lowercase s is. Um, but if you had a problem with lowercase s, you can plug it into here. M sub s, you can plug into here. OK. Again, it should strike you as strange that spin, say, is quantized. In real life, something can spin as much or as little as you like. Uh, but it turns out that at the atomic level, only certain, po only certain things are possible. There's only two possible spins here, say, for the electron. So they, what do they mean spin the action of the electron is, is spin? Well, actually, it turns out that it's not really spinning, in a sense. Because, um, yeah, in a sense, the electron's not really spinning. However, it's doing something that has some of the properties of spinning. Okay. So this, the word spinning here is kind of like an analogy. They call it the spin because it has some effects that would be the same as if a macroscopic object was spinning. So in some ways it's like it's spinning, and in some ways it's like it's not. Uh, but they decided to use the word spin uh, to emphasize the ways that it was like something that's spinning. Uh, and in an introductory course like this, you're not really going to get into the details of exactly how it's like spin, which is good because I don't know those details. <laughs> okay. All I know is that in some ways it's like it's spinning, and in some ways it's not. Okay. Here's a good summary on page 656. This is a good thing to highlight. So this tells us what these stands for. N is the shell, L is the subshell, M sub L is the orbital, just like we've been talking about. This gives us the allowed values. We already have this, but N has to be a positive integer. L can be a non-negative integer up to n minus 1. M sub L is centered around 0 up to L. And M sub, uh, M sub S has to be negative 1 half or positive 1 half. We talked about S, P, D, and F. I don't think you need to know these capital letters for N, so we can skip that. Um, and we can also see the possible number of states here. For example, um, there's always N subshells in the nth shell, and two sub L orbitals, and two, obviously two spins. So for example, this is N. The third shell has one, two, three subshells. And uh, if you have, say, d equals 2, notice how many orbitals are there. Um, well, there are uh, six, right? Six 
No, five. Yeah. Which is uh, two, two, two L plus one. Yeah. And here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Two L plus one. Uh, All right. Uh, like I say, I'm not really into these formulas. You should be able to figure this out just by writing down these tables and seeing how many possible values there are. But anyway, that might be a good table for you to review for the exam. All right, what I think is most useful that we went over here is how to split the periodic table into blocks. Again, this would be a good thing to do on the exam, just to split the periodic table into blocks. And this was very important. The first P block is the second shell. The first D block is the third shell. And the first F block is the fourth shell. So this starts with 3D, and this is 4F over here. Most of the stuff we talked about can be read directly from the periodic table. A lot of the stuff you don't need special formulas for. You can read a lot of this information straight out of the periodic table. All right, and now it just takes practice uh, to, uh, to avoid the common traps and get comfortable with different ideas.